Good morning, everybody in Tokyo, and good evening, everyone in New York. Uh, I'm Alicia Ogawa. I'm director of the project on Japanese corporate uh, governance and stewardship here at CJEB, and it's my great delight to welcome you to this discussion with Mr. Matsumoto, the CEO of Monix Group. I've been looking forward to it for some time. Um, as I always say, the Center on Japanese, the um, program on Japanese um, corporate governance and stewardship, the aim is not just to focus on Japan, but to compare Japan, UK, EU, and Asia uh, in hopes that we can learn from each other, to dig up the best practices from each jurisdiction and find what works for everybody. And uh, Mr. Matsumoto is in a unique position in this sense, because not only is Monex a global company, but he has had, on the governance side, uh, experience being an independent director on the boards of Japanese companies. He obviously is the CEO and chairman of his own company, and he currently sits on the board of MasterCard. So he has seen uh, a lot, a lot of different practices, and uh, I hope he will share his views with us on what he thinks is the best of the best. Um, I almost never spend time going over speaker's biography at these events because I don't want to take the time to dwell on somebody's past accomplishments rather than the subject we're here to debate. But in this case, I think it is important to make an exception because Matsumoto-san is a bit of a renaissance man. He's active in so many areas where I have little or no expertise. A mutual friend of ours, uh, Oki-san, says that the Monex website is like a parking lot of great ideas and you can stroll around and choose from any of the nicest models. So I'd like to give our viewers the full Matsumoto menu, even if it doesn't, con if, if it contains things that I don't eat, uh, because maybe some people in the audience will find them very tasty and would like to ask questions about them. So I want to make sure everybody knows what's on offer. Um, things like the human genome or trading ether futures are not things that I think about every day, but maybe there are people in the audience who do. Matsumoto-san started his career at Salomon Brothers in Tokyo, where, sadly, I just missed working with him by a couple of weeks. He moved to Goldman Sachs, and he quickly became the youngest person to make a partner there. He left Goldman four years later in 1999 to start Monex, one of the earliest online brokerages in Japan, which is now known at this moment as the Monex Group. Monex grew through a series of acquisitions, a long list of acquisitions, including Saison Securities, Nico Beans, Sony Bank Securities, and several others. Trade Station was acquired in the United States in 2012 and CoinCheck in 2018. And now I'd, I'd like to give you an idea of some of Matsumoto-san's energy and his range of ideas. So here are some of the things that Monex, Monex has announced just since January. TradeStation announced it will offer trading of Ether futures on the CME. An affiliate company, GenX, has raised money for a blockchain-enabled data platform, which will accumulate healthcare-related big data. Monex ent entered into a partnership with Japan's Aplos to launch a Monex-branded credit card. CoinJack Japan has announced cryptocurrency trading of Engine Coin. And Matsumoto-san recently established a sustainable finance department, which will launch a climate impact fund. That's all happened since the start of 2021. And this is by no means a full list. I invite you to look at his website. But for me, what's most interesting is, of course, the relationship to corporate governance and stewardship. And Matsumoto-san had an idea about a year ago, which I found so fascinating. He had the idea to use his retail client base to create an army of activists ready to serve as a catalyst to unlock the value of Japanese companies. And Japan Cat Catalyst is the name of the vehicle that he established in 2019. Um, I can't wait to hear all about what's happened and what is happening. He has had a series of educational seminars for his clients, teaching them about activism and how shareholder engagement works and how proxy voting works and so on and so forth. So my plan is to dive right into a conversation with Matsumoto-san, but please do take advantage of the opportunity to send questions via the Q&A uh, button, and I will do my best to monitor those. I want to say quickly, there were a number of uh, uh, people who, when they registered, 
indicated questions they wanted to ask, but some of them were very, very broad, uh, like banking and finance or global risks. Um, if you have a more specific question um, that we, I could pose to Mr. Matsumoto, please feel free to um, enter it into the chat box, I mean into the Q&A uh, queue, and I will monitor that. So Matsumoto-san, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for sharing with us all your experience and your views. And the first question I want to ask is probably a question you have been asked a hundred times, which is, please tell us briefly, what made you quit your high profile position at Goldman Sachs to start an online brokerage? What made you feel that 1999, there was something happening that you saw the opportunity? What, what was going on? Thank you, Alicia. Uh, uh, actually, it was 1998. Sorry. I, no, I proposed to Goldman Sachs uh, 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 of the uh, new business idea, which is to create an a, a online brokerage business inside Goldman Sachs. I said that, uh, you know, what, made, what makes of the investment banking business is the risk money and access to risk money and access to risk sellers and also you know expertise financial technologies or you know whatever and the technology or, or expertise part can be transferred easily by hiring people and access to risk sellers is actually easy as long as you have cash to buy someone's risk away from that person then that person or entity would just sell asset to you so access to the risk money is the most important part essential part of the, uh, the making investment banking business and the internet was coming that time and then you know all financial institutions all you know institutional investors they are just intermediary of the you know uh, natural person's risk you know uh, capacity right so with the internet coming there will be some uh, how do you say bypassing those intermediaries and then so uh, uh, having a direct access to the, the uh, natural person who are the ultimate risk taker would be very important for investment banking business so i proposed to goldman sachs let's create a direct access to retail customers but they said they being you know cosine and the blank frame of those guys they said no you know uh, we don't deal with the uh, retail customers so I had to leave the company and I created my own company. By the way, Goldman in uh, 20 years later, or exactly. 15 years later, you know, they, they, they started doing it. But uh, so that's how uh, I started the business. Yeah, but um, I don't mean to um, push, but did you feel that you could create a demand among Japanese retail investors by offering them pl this platform? Or did you see a change among Japanese retail investors that made you think, aha, I see the demand, here's something I can provide them with? Did you feel that you could create the demand or was it something that you saw happening? It was more like, uh, you know, uh, we, I did, we didn't see the, any, how do you say, demand on surface. It, it is more, it was, more like uh, because of internet new technology maybe we can you know create something new to uh, develop to dig out the, the new demand mm -hmm. you know that time i was only 34 years old and uh, you know my, i i i i i thought um, you know i would try and goldman was preparing ipo as you know right goldman was doing ipo just half year after i left the farm so if I stayed in Goldman, I would have received a you know head amount of uh, money, which is kind of stealing money from former partners as well as future partners. <laughs> I was, and I was 34, 35, you know, and uh, I kind of thought that I would be uh, overwhelmed and killed by the amount of money I received just by a fortune, which I didn't kind of I didn't have brave to take it, huh. uh, so uh, I left and then I tried to create my own. That's really an interesting point. I don't think I ever heard you say that. Um, but again, when you first started Monex, 
where did most of the customers come from? Were they people who were investing for the very first time? Or were you taking clients away from the big four brokers? Um, and how does your typical client now differ from clients who are at the traditional brokers? At the beginning, you know, the most of customers came from uh, uh, traditional brokers. The biggest one was the Nomura. I think at the beginning, like a six, 50 percent of the, uh, our customers came from Nomura. So, uh, so that's how we started. But recently, uh, you know, we already almost uh, acquired customers from big brokers. Uh, those who we should get, we got them already. <laughs> so, so these days, the customers are coming from, you know, completely from, uh, you know, from outside of. The community uh, who you know uh, of the uh, uh, stock investment, so more like uh, the bank depositors and those people and the young people uh, mm -hmm. coming to open accounts. Do you have any, um, I guess, information you can share with us about what is a typical client of yours in terms of age or? Ah, that is an interesting question. Twenty-two years ago, when I was thirty-five. The uh, our customers, you know, profile uh, mean was like a 35 years old man. Now, you know, 22 years past, I'm 57, and our customers kind of uh, you know median is 57 years old. <laughs> so <laughs> somehow, you know, the it, it's it's actually not so good thing. Our customers, you know, uh, basically aged together with me so the, the, the you know we, we may we may talk about that later but uh, the, the three years ago we acquired coincheck yes. that's a cryptocurrency uh, exchange in japan their customer base is like uh, teenagers or 20s and 30s <laughs> wow the vast majority is in 20s mm -hmm. right so that is a very different customer you know segment uh, which manex tradi traditionally have so that is uh, you know by by having coincheck that is a very great uh, kind of indent mm -hmm. of the, uh, the you know, younger generation to the Manex group. Yeah, so, um, so many regulators and economists and FSA commissioners complain that Japanese household savings stays in the bank and doesn't mm -hmm. enter the capital markets. Mm -hmm. Can you offer your observations about why that's so and how is it changing? And by the way, has COVID changed that? I mean, here in the United States, when people are staying home, they're trading more, et cetera. But why, what do you think needs to happen to convince Japanese savers that the equity market is a safe and the best place for them to safeguard their wealth? Well, you know, I think it's kind of chicken and egg. The first of all, I don't, uh, take those uh, uh, officials uh, argument. I, I, I think they are wrong. You know, what, what happened was, you know, uh, 1989, there was a bubble, right? 87, in the late 1980s, there was a bubble, okay? So the stocks are all time high and then, you know, real estate very high and such and such. Now you remember that uh, if you have a money to buy the uh, Imperial Palace in Japan, uh, in Tokyo, you could buy the entire California state. Okay. This is crazy, stupid, stupid, uh, stupid idea. But anyway, what happened was when the bubble burst, okay, as a nation, as a household in general in Japan, were net seller of the real estate and the stocks. Of course, there are some people who got, you know, stuck at the high price of the real estate and the stock. But in general, household was net seller of real estate and stocks. You know, whenever you know a, bu a bubble happened in the uh, domestic asset in in the history, like a tulip bubble in the Netherlands, you know, always at the peak of the bubble, the household was a net buyer. Mm -hmm. But only in Japan in history, that time, the Japanese household was net seller of the bubbled asset, and then actually bank bought it. Mm -hmm. right? Household sold real estate, and then they didn't. With that proceed, well, of course, people could say, even though no, no, they didn't sell, they were just, uh, you know, the, the collateral was uh, forfeited. 
Okay, but whatever the you know the the process may be as a phenomena, they were seller of the real estate, and with that proceed, they didn't buy stocks, they didn't buy data asset, and they bought then six percent yielding yen fixed income, right? And then stock tanked, mm. data tanked, mm. right? And the rates tanked, meaning fixed income went price went up, yeah, right? So they moved uh, the proceed to the best performing asset for the coming like 20 years. Yeah. Okay. How come you? How come one can say that the Japanese people are not sophisticated or not good investor? They were the perfect great investor. They put money into the best performing asset. You're right. Okay. So the the reason why I say chicken and egg is that. Uh, so the, they didn't buy uh, stocks uh, because stock were going down, mm, mm, mm. right? So it, it's a so cause and uh, you know, result, uh, you know, the other way around, okay? Right. So now the after abenomics, you know, stocks started rising mm. and after COVID it's rising uh, more, you know, uh, quickly and then just naturally more and more people and money from retail people in japan coming to the stock market mm -hmm. so all those are in fsa or you know those people saying is totally uh misstatement i think yeah. so the problem is not because problem is not the retail people's behavior problem was the issuer problem was that the issuer's stock price uh, did go down, mm, right? Mm. That's why corporate governance and those kind of things is very important. You know, so as the the, the uh, companies become better and the share price go up, then naturally people will come. Yeah, I, I mean, another issue um, is not only the stock price was going down, but you'll remember that I used to be an equity analyst covering some of those asset management companies. And back in the bad old days, you know, they would churn and charge commissions and, you know, the retail investor would really um, kind of be disadvantaged because of that. And I understand that uh, that doesn't happen anymore, but uh, it makes perfect sense what you say. Um, if we can talk about corporate governance now, because you have pointed out that this is a trend or a force or a current, which is going to drive the stock market higher. Um, and uh, I want to talk to the audience, or I want you to talk to the audience about your vision for empowering retail investors. Uh, I felt very lucky to sit in on some of the meetings you had in New York when you were describing this plan. Um, I, um, just for the audience, um, what I heard Matsumoto-san say, he can tell me that I'm misquoting him. But, um, you know, um, if you, retail investors everywhere in the world, are a problem for corporate governance people because they never vote. They never vote their shares. And um, I hope that in the United States, we've learned the lesson that if you don't vote, you, the wrong guy gets in office. Um, but your vision, as I remember it, was to try to train the retail investors to engage, to participate. Um, and then you've, at the same time, realized that your own business model needed to switch to becoming of a more of an asset management business. I remember when you were having these discussions in New York, there was that announcement by Fidelity and TD that they were going to zero commissions, right? And uh, I guess that's what sparked um, your slight change of focus. But can you tell us about Japan Catalyst and tell us about these seminars that you hold for your retail clients? Tell us how it's going, and then I have some specific questions about it. It's funded well, by and not big institutions, right? So how are you going to use this army? Yeah. The, uh, so we started the online brokerage 22 years ago, and then we um, made uh, retail customers much closer to the market. You know, the uh, almost the same level of a commission, uh, same kind of speed to the access to the market, and the same kind of information available to uh, retail customers. 
uh, compared with the uh, professional institutional investors. So we made, you know, landscape completely changed. But what happened was uh, uh, with that, retail investors started becoming more interested in price movement. Mm -hmm. They trade around, uh, you know, leveraged ETF, for example, mm -hmm. and they're watching uh, prices, but they started losing some interest in individual companies. Okay, that I felt very uh, kind of uh, concerned, you know, it, it's better for uh, more people to have interest in each company's uh, uh, business or management. Then, you know, the company would receive more kind of wisdom or, you know, you know, ideas from, you know, a variety of people, right? You say, you know, the, uh, in, uh, uh, you know, in the States, shareholders uh, uh, grew companies. And in Japan, consumers uh, grew companies, you know, but samely, the shareholders in J of Japanese companies can give many comments, many insights to, you know, Japanese companies. Uh, that's why, you know, I, I started, uh, you know, this Japan Actives, uh, Manex Activist Fund, whereby we raise, uh, so far, we raise money from uh, our retail customers and then kind of engage them to think about the what to tell to the issuers, and then uh, we I engage with the issuers, and then you know do the uh, lot of engagement and activism and blah blah blah. And time to time I tell them, you know, it's not only my opinion, but also retail people in Japan mm. are saying the same thing. And then from a Japanese you know management point of view you know, they love to listen to consumers' voices, but they hate to listen, they hate to go to the shareholders' meeting. <laughs> Strangely, yeah. right? But when I say to the Japanese CEOs, you know, your retail customers are also saying the same thing. That is a kind of a big, how do you say, uh, kind of a very uh, new kind of impact, mm -hmm. you know, so it's not coming from the, it's not the voice coming from New York. Right, exactly. Sure. I remember right. you, you were very interested in a company, you made me very interested in the company, which aggregates the retail client's interest and then tries to show them where, how to make proposals or how to get on a conference call or how to, um, you know, which issues they're interested in that they could vote on, whether it's climate change or diversity or... CEO pay or something. Um, so you are gathering this information from your customers via these seminars or are you using some kind of technology? We have a platform to uh, uh, collect those ah, voices. I see. But, but we are not just uh, kind of uh, casting those voices to issue us, uh -huh. right? Because we as a professional uh, investor, we read those voices and then we take some of course, there are some, uh, you know, good voices and uh, not so good voices. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we kind of digest and then take some, uh, you know, good part of those voices uh, as a part of our kind of, uh, you know, thinking process and then engage with uh, issuers. And also it is very important to engage those real retail investors. You know, as, as you mentioned that uh, we just had the uh, Manex Activist Forum uh, last Saturday. And about 3,000, more than 3,000 people came uh, to join uh, online to the forum. And we kind of, uh, how do you say, discuss about corporate governance. We got Seth Fisher, or Oasis, as a keynote speaker. And, and then we, we did, uh, you know, the uh, panel discussion, including Jesper, Jesper Ko. <laughs> and then, you know, we talk about, uh, you know, activism, we talk about engagement, we talk about how we can you know, uh, uh, improve Japanese companies and how we can improve those companies' share price. Uh, so we try to engage retail customers. You know, we try to have them more engaged in, you know, uh, looking at the uh, individual companies because those eyes and uh, voices would be very good thing for Japanese issues. 
I'm so interested that you chose Mr. Fisher of Oasis because I think, generally speaking, among corporate Japan, he's not considered a nice man. <laughs> um, there are other activists who are more gentle, um, but how do your retail clients react to somebody like Mr. Fisher? Do they understand what he's trying to do? You know, is the fact that he's a foreigner, does that make them uncomfortable? I'm just curious, you know, um, in many cases, you need these bad things. You know, it's not so much the case anymore, but as you know, for a long time, activists were considered bad. So how is that changing? And how do you see the changes in attitude among your clients? Well, Seth Fisher is not bad at all. No, no, if, no, you, I... if you carefully listen to what he's saying, it all makes sense. I agree. Okay. Um, I think he's better than almost anybody else. Yeah, forgive me. I, I, forgive me. Forgive but, but, but anyway, anyway. But you know, the, the many Japanese management are afraid of you know, talking to uh, uh, Seth Fisher, right? I, I'm doing engagement, and then you know, uh, uh, I am. Um, but, but you know, even uh, uh, Seth Fisher, you know, he doesn't talk to the top management uh, regularly. You know, uh, it either uh, his subordinate talking to the CFO or someone of the company, and then time to time they write a letter to the management, right? So, and I think that is kind of the case for all, almost all other engagement funds mm -hmm. Japan, uh, uh, on to, to the Japanese companies, if it's a US-based or Hong Kong-based or Singapore-based, whatever. In my case, when we try to do the engagement, I tend to know the CEO direct, directly mm -hmm. as a kind of uh, as a friend, or I've been in the business for already like 30, 40 years. So I know them direct, or I know the, the, the board members directly, yeah, external board members directly. At worst, I could reach to the, uh, the CEO by just going through one you know, mutual acquaintance. So I can meet a CEO, not in a business context, but more like in the, like a friend connection, mm -hmm. right? And also I'm not, I'm not, uh, you know, the, uh, I'm not, the, you know, I'm not a fund manager. I'm, I'm not the, you know, a rookie fund manager sitting in New York and I just came up with idea and then just uh, spreading out that idea to the Japanese, Japanese management. I have been managing my company, listed company, for more than 20 years. And uh, I, uh, I sat on the uh, Tokyo Stock Exchange board for uh, five years as well. I've gone through many things, right? So I could, so I, I could meet, I, I meet with those Japanese CEOs through friend connection, you know, uh, and I can share their uh, pain, right? And then I, I share, I can understand their pain uh, and then, but I can discuss, I understand your pain, but there are something still you could do uh, like this. And if you do that, then the uh, perception of the company would be different or the, you know, uh, the return on equity would be better because of such and such. Um, and there are the, there are the methods uh, uh, doing that like this, and I can explain all those kind of things, not just uh, telling them to do, but sure. more like uh, discussing with them, right? And then they have, uh, you know, they have they have uh, years to listen to me. Yeah. So that is very different from the other uh, engagement funds. Sure. And as I remember you saying, you know, you are you are you are um, passing on the views of Japanese citizens not some sovereign wealth fund or not some you know group of rich guys in london or new york it's hard if i'm a japanese ceo it's hard for me to say you know i feel i'm being treated unfairly because it's you and it's japanese citizens retail people who are behind these ideas so let me, let me follow on from that because it, it sounds like what you're describing is a very effective strategy but it's also probably difficult to scale 
you know, into a thousand companies, right? So do you have a kind of target for the number of companies that will be in your portfolio, the number of companies you will engage with? Um, or have you, have you thought about that yet? Currently, uh, we have about uh, uh, low teens, you know, the 10 plus number of uh, uh, investee companies in our portfolio. And but I, I think, uh, you know, uh, as regard to the size, uh, we do have a capacity to do, you know, much bigger. But uh, answering the question, how many companies uh, we could engage is uh, actually a good question. Um, you know, because as I said, so far, the specialty of our fund is uh, my kind of special network to yours and the government and such and such. And the question is how much uh, we can leverage that. Mm -hmm. um, but you know what, even with the, uh, but you know, we can, we can, we can, you know, uh, currently we're doing uh, this fund uh, by like uh, like five people team, but uh, we can add more professionals, and then you know I could kind of leverage my you know network uh, through those lieutenants. So uh, I'm not uh, that worried about uh, you know uh, increasing capacity. Yeah, no, no, I, I I appreciate your honesty. As you know, there are many big funds who claim to be stewardship engagement funds. And when you have 1,200 stocks in your portfolio, it's kind of hard <laughs> to really... It, it is kind of hard because, uh, you know, uh, recently I actually uh, said in public domain, uh, I was actually engaging uh, with the, the company called Jafco. Mm -hmm. And um, and uh, you know they, as you know, many people may know, they hold the healthy you know, NRI's share, you know, Nomura Research Institute. Right. Jafco used to be the in the Nomura Group. Right. Yep. And the Jafco's uh, market cap is like something like a two hundred billion yen, and uh, their holding of NRI was like hundred forty billion yen. It's kind of crazy and such and such, and many funds try to unlock that mm -hmm. in the past years, four years, right. but nothing happened, nothing happened. Right. I spent uh, time with the CEO of the company. I had the dinner uh, with him like uh, four times and I had a, a one-on-one -on -one dinner for four times and a one-on-one -on -one meeting for like five times in like a three months. Wow. So total wow. of like a 10 one-on-one -on -one meetings in three months in deep and then discuss about what they should do, blah, blah, blah. And then look, what happened was the, in January, they announced, they, they, not, uh, and then, uh, they announced and they did. They sold 40% of NRI you know, holdings and then both announced they use all proceeds to buy back their shares, okay? Right. It's, not, it's not a goal, it, it's just a beginning mm -hmm. uh, what uh, you know, Jafco can or should do, mm. but this is, you know, this tells me and this, this tells you too, the engagement is something, it's not just writing a letter. You have to really get close to the, the top management and really spend energy to get to the conclusion, right? Mm. So for that meaning, uh, uh, your kind of concern or question is the good question because I don't think we, we can engage like 100 companies. Mm. Right? We have to focus to, you know, uh, some good, you know, some small number of companies to make changes. But as we make more successes, I think uh, the more companies would be more willing to, you know, listen to us so that, uh, you know, the our energy uh, spent to be the, the engagement with one company will probably go down, right? So then we can we can expand the capacity. I think. Yeah. No, that's uh, it's very exciting. Um, there is somebody, uh, an old friend of both of ours, Mr. Sudi Mariapa, who has one question. He says, "What are the two or three aspects of corporate governance that 
we really need to move forward in Japan. And I was going to ask you if you could comment on that, uh, including your perspective from serving on an American board. You know, what do you see is better or worse on both sides? But let's start with Sudi's question about what are the two or three challenges uh, or obstacles to better corporate governance in Japan as you see them? Okay, thank you, Sudi. Uh, it's, uh, it's great to hear the old friend's name. Um, I think, you know, so I, I, I'm sitting on the board of MasterCard and uh, I'm quite familiar with the corporate governance reforms in Japan as well. And as of right now, what's written in the corporate governance code and what's requested by TSC uh, to the, uh, the uh, listed companies, you know, what, what written there are pretty much the same as you see in the States. Okay. But there's, a, there's one big difference. There's one big difference I see, which is the company or CEO's respect to the external directors, outside board members. Mm -hmm. In the States, they do respect, the company and the CEOs do respect, you know, outside board members. Because outside board members can fire them, exactly. fire him, fire her. And uh, respect, the word respect may be wrong. They may not, re they may not be respecting, but they do <laughs> listen to you. <laughs> Right. They will listen to uh, external directors. So because of that, the outside board members do talk, do speak up as well. And outside board members do feel obliged to come up with the opinions about the company or about the discussion. They feel they are not allowed to be silent all day long on the board meeting. So they really think hard you know, what we should do, what I can do, what I, I should do for the company, okay? In Japan, uh, you know, of course there are companies and CEOs who do respect outside board members, but unfortunately there are many Japanese companies still whereby they don't respect outside board members. They just uh, get the uh, you know, outside board or members because of the quota. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, be pressed by the uh, uh, exchange or the government, and they don't respect uh, outside the board members. So that is the biggest, uh, biggest uh, 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 issue. So I was thinking that uh, there's a one way to uh, change that uh, quickly, uh, which is, you know, as regards the, uh, to, uh, okay. as regards the, the, the list of the, uh, the, uh, the board members uh, uh, submitted to the, the uh, AGM, Torishimari Akusenin Gian, that should be only submitted by shareholders, not by the company. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting idea. Okay. Of course, we can, we can set the criteria, you know, uh, you, you have to own more than 1% or whatever percentage of the, the share for more than like uh, six months or something. But the, that, that, that kind of shareholder uh, can only, you know, submit the uh, director's list. Okay. So if that, if that, if we make that change, the companies uh, will you know, right after AGM, they would start talking to those shareholders and then explain what they think the, the director's list should be. And then shareholders ask them, okay, so among those lists, who are going to be the CEO and such and such, such and such. And then also, so what about those, uh, you know, the external directors? Uh, why you are up trying to uh, have those external directors? And the company would say, well, because we, 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 we direct to have expertise for technology or blah, 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 blah. And the shareholders say, shareholders can say, okay, for that reason, I can get you better person, right? Blah, blah, blah. And that, that, that way, you know, we can, we can really change the kind of uh, dynamics between the company CEO and the board member, uh, external board member, the shareholder. And then all of a sudden, the board is going to act on behalf of the, the shareholders 
not just uh, you know uh, you know approving the, the what the CEO is saying. So that that kind of uh, thing. Uh, if that happens, that would be a, a good, uh, good thing, very good thing for, for, for Japan, I think. Yeah, but you are placing your faith in the investors then. Uh, I think one of the things that frustrates me is investors can make a proposal for an external director, and sometimes there are very good people nominated, but some of the old, some companies, some investors, some asset managers, for mysterious reasons or bad reasons, just won't vote for them, right? You know, if somebody says, I don't like that guy, or I don't like the person who proposed him, or, you know, I think this is also a problem, but we're not interested in my opinion, we're interested in your opinion. Um, how about, um, are there any other governance issues you can think of? Uh, you've talked about cross shareholding, and you are actively engaging, but this is obviously um, a long term complaint of many shareholders. And, uh, are you optimistic that um, the progress seems very, very slow? Are you? Um... Well, well, actually, you know, you, you're right. About 10% of the, uh, the Japanese, uh, about 10% of the TSC market cap is, uh, you know, uh, listed subsidiaries. Right. Okay. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Okay. But there, we, 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 we are now seeing the parent buying back uh, subsidiary, listed subsidiaries. Yeah, that is good. Cases, in some cases, it's not a very fair price, as Mr. Fisher said. Yeah, yeah, yes, that is, that is really the, you know, a very uh, important point. So I've been telling, I've been talking to the FSA, you know, this price really does matter. Right. Well, look okay. at the case of Iremitsu, right? So the, the, like uh, there are some you know concrete examples even like last one, one year there are some yeah. cases whereby price was really cheap, yeah. right? Right. So we we have to we have to and I, I'm actually proposing to FSA that uh, whenever the parent buy back the uh, the, the sub uh, by law uh, we should request to. Uh, uh, have the kind of appraiser for the, the share price, right. uh, for the buyback price, but appraiser should not be the investment banker. Mm. Because uh, unfortunately, you know, in this, uh, you know, Japanese companies, parent buy, buying back uh, the sub, investment banks are doing completely poor job. There are some agency issue, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we should, we should, we should, we should, we should, we should uh, make this uh, appraiser uh, job only available to like uh, accountants or lawyers who have like you know they have a national license and if breach some uh, uh, responsibility those license would be taken away so that how you know we we, we can create some sort of uh, you know real third party you know independent type of opinion so we should create that kind of uh, uh, kind of uh, mechanism mm. uh, and, uh, in Japan. Yeah. So that is going to create a kind of new kind of uh, uh, job, like, uh, you know, appraiser, you know, uh, you know, kind of thing in Japan, but uh, that, that we, we're going to have to do something like that. Yeah. Um, I also would like to, my own um, interest is uh, voting disclosure by asset managers. is not very easy to track, but so it would be really nice to be able to hold if I, you know, asset managers accountable for the way that they vote, but it's it's pretty opaque right now. Um, there's a lot of questions here, a lot of questions. I thought there would be a lot about crypto, but um, one person is is making a comment about um, restrictions on American investors, like FATCA, is really hampering our ability to act as global investors. I'd also like to ask you a question about Guy Tamiho about FEFTA about whether you feel, I know you didn't ask for an advantage, but do you feel you are at an advantage uh, relative to foreign companies who have to make a lot more filing, jump, a lot, jump through a lot more hoops before they do certain things? Do you feel you have an advantage over foreign firms because of Guy Tamiho? Well, uh, technically, yes, because uh, we are, you know, uh, uh, domestically domiciled fund, 
so we have a uh, uh, hundred percent freedom to make uh, you know uh, votes, you know, proposals, voting, yeah. everything, proposal. Yeah. Uh, having said that, <clears throat> I, I I think that uh, you know the, or, or even the uh, the foreign uh, investors can do almost the uh, same thing. Uh, but what we are advantaged is not because of law, not because of FATCA, because of the FEFTA or whatever, uh, because I know those uh, bureaucrats very well. If it's uh, FSA, uh, uh, MOF, METI, and uh, Ministry of uh, uh, Resource and Energy, or the um, land and transport, uh, uh, mm -hmm. land and transportation, whatever, all those ministries, the, the top to the Kyokcho, head of bureau, mm -hmm. you know, they are, you know, uh, uh, most of them are my classmates. So I can talk to them uh, directly as a, as a friend. Mm -hmm. So that, so, uh, so I can talk to, uh, for example, that guy, Tameho, mm -hmm. you know, I can, I do talk to though that very, you know, people who wrote and executed those laws. So that is a big advantage of me compared to the foreign investors. Mm. I don't think they can ever access to, you know, uh, uh, those people are, or, or ever they can have a friendly you know open discussion with them mm. but which i can i'm sorry you know there may be some fans listening to this uh, this, this this call um uh, this is not uh, discrimination i just happen to have a network so i can <laughs> do that, that is a, this that is an advantage but i don't think the law itself is, is not really you know um no, making no, I, a huge, yeah, huge difference. No, I don't. I, I think you're quite right. I think most uh, foreign investors, especially when they're talking to about mid cap or small cap companies, they don't find the, the new law a problem at all. But it does require more filing. It does require more lawyers and so on. But my concern, uh, this is not a question for you, but a comment. It's not Japan and it's not America. It's every country in the world is putting up new restrictions about I, foreign investment. And nope. uh, you know, I'm just afraid we could end up in a world where only Americans can invest in American companies and only Japanese can invest in Japanese companies. And, you know, that's a that's an extreme position. But um, there's so many questions here. Let me uh, get to one. One person is talking about um, the race to zero commissions and how it gave rise to Robin Hood and, um, you know, that also moved on to fidelity and so on. And do you feel that this is a healthy thing? Do you feel it's stimulating more retail investments? But I think it, of course, it is, of course, stimulating uh, retail involvement uh, in the in the market. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but it's not hundred percent clear if it is stimulating investment. Um, the, you know, I know that zero commission doesn't necessarily help your investment successful. Right. You gotta have a right idea. Exactly. You gotta have a right risk, uh, uh, risk management expertise, or you gotta have a right asset allocation idea, you know, uh, blah, blah, blah. So that is, uh, by far more important than zero commission, right? Yeah. So, so zero commission itself is not a bad thing, but I'm worried about that uh, if the, the industry getting too focused on uh, too focused on those things and then omitting to try to provide a better advice on investment, then that would be bad. I understand that in the states, the Robin Hood and everybody, you know. Uh, racing to offer the various uh, uh, services like options and such and such, such and such. Again, it doesn't necessarily help customers to do better investment. Right? Yeah. There's a question here that's related to what you're saying. Uh, 
somebody, this person didn't give his name, but the comment is that this, I'm reading it. This is not my opinion, but he says, in general, people in Japan have less financial literacy than in the United States. And that I guess the implication is if you make trading free, uh, people who don't know what they're doing, <laughs> you know, are getting getting involved and maybe lose money. Um, I'd like to add my own comment, which is that I've been in communication with Ministry of Health and Welfare with a group of people who are looking at introduction of, you know, um, IRA, 401k kind of things in Japan. And I think that's the reason why I don't know that American people are more financially literate, but they're more aware, right, of stock prices and stock tickers and so on because they have 401ks. So the question is, um, do you think that you can do something to increase financial literacy in Japan? Do you think it's, it's a danger to give somebody free trading if they don't know what they're doing? Well, as I said at the like upfront of this uh, uh, you know, call, you know, I actually believe that the Japanese retail people's financial literacy is uh, actually very high. Um, I think I, I don't. Um, I think uh, you know the interesting thing is in Japan, whenever government uh, provide the the guidance, I mean provide the the guard or regulation, then the uh, something bad happens. Uh, thing is, like uh, you know, the government try to uh, protect the, the financial business and the telecommunication business. And look, the Japanese financial business and the telecommunication business is just nowhere in the globe. Used to be, it's a triple A, triple A banks, and the NTT and the, uh, the mobile NTT mobile was uh, really by far the best technology in, in the globe, but now, you know, nowhere, right? Yeah. Like motorcycle or camera, the government never tried to protect them mm -hmm. and they became the world number one, right? So, so I think it, 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 interestingly, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not education, it's not the guidance. It's, you know, Japanese people tend to perform very well when they are given freedom, right? So I, I'm not worried about the Japanese retail people's financial literacy, but I'm worried about if the FSA is limiting the access to certain investees, then I'm very worried about it. That's actually happening right now. You know, the, uh, I, I understand that not many questions to crypto, but, uh, you know, in the States, there are more asset managers, endowment, you know, listed companies, uh, the family office, they are buying Bitcoins, right? Because they are buying Bitcoins, you know, the OCC is now making the banks to do the custody of the uh, cryptos. Yes. Okay, so it's, it's going in, in, in that direction. In Japan, you know, the, uh, the trust banks cannot custody uh, crypto. Okay, so there's just only like, uh, you know, the crypto exchange like CoinCheck can custody, but, you know, for the, for the, the institution investors to come to uh, the, the, the market, we need to have someone like a uh, trust bank, so those, uh, those guys uh, to do custody of the crypto, but it's not happening in Japan. So it's basically in the States. And now, you know, you, 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 you saw that uh, Larry Fink's letter, BlackRock, you know, they're now buying, uh, they decided to buy, invest into crypto, but it's not happening in Japan. Mm. Last one year, because of the uh, super, con you know, uh, quantum easing, super, you know, monetary easing, you know, if you look at the various asset, the, 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 the higher the risk, the higher the return, right? So fixed income is very low risk, low return, zero almost, and the Bitcoin, high volatility and highest return. And the Japan, US uh, asset managers can own Bitcoin, but it's not the case in Japan. It's like a Japanese asset managers uh, are playing golf without a driver. <laughs> 
right? We have a US players doing golf with driver, right? <laughs> so that is ridiculous. That is ridiculous. So that, that kind of uh, regulation or uh, taking away the freedom from Japanese people, that I worried about. Yeah, I think you should have a t-shirt. It sounds like a great t-shirt to say, Japanese people do great with freedom. Um, but there is there are two questions. One is related to crypto and one is related to this topic. So my old friend, uh, Koide-san at Asset Management One, he says, could you comment on Japanese retail investors' speculative move during the bubble years in comparison to the current episode in America? I suppose he's saying, he's saying, is there some similarity? The, the behavior of Japanese retail investors in the bubble years compared, uh, yep. compared to what's going on in the U.S. now. Is it the same? Uh, I, the short answer is I don't know because in the bubble year, I was still at uh, uh, a university, basically. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know very well, but I think it's very different. I think it's very different. You know, this time, you know, you know, the meme stock thing is really kind of creature in the SNS era, yeah. right? And, and uh, the each, and also each uh, uh, trading is very small, mm -hmm. but the tremendous, tremendous amount of, you know, retail investors came together. Mm -hmm. Back in, back in uh, the bubble era in Japan, the information, information, uh, you know, information was very limited. But so that was bubble was, it was, so that was, was yeah. yeah, so that bubble was created in a sense because of the limited information. Yes, yes. Right? But this time of the meme stock, you know, uh, frenzy is because of the, you know, too quick information kind of super highway through SNS. Mm -hmm. So I think the, 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 the mechanism of what happened was, uh, I think, probably quite different mm -hmm. this time and that time. But I, I want to also, when you were in college, so you didn't know this was going on, let's remember that Japanese companies only reported Kesan twice per year. So for six months, you had no information, right? Just uasa, just rumor. And so people mm -hmm. traded a lot on that. Um, the other question that I wanted to ask you comes from Miss uh, Kathleen Rowe of um, Federal Reserve Bank of New York. So answer carefully. <laughs> she, <laughs> says, she says, what, what is the level of public trust and awareness of cryptocurrency as an investment opportunity in Japan? Uh, it is still very low, I would say. You know, it's, uh, there, there are people doing it, you know, the, the, our subsidiary coin check, you know, they have about uh, 2 million or 3 million uh, individual accounts. And uh, so there are people making investment into uh, Bitcoin. And also there is a more rising interest towards that. But still, as a kind of nationwide phenomena, it's very, very low. Because, and, you know, the government officials basically saying uh, Bitcoin, is not with any backing. It's not with any anything to back. But I would say, okay, even Himino san or the you know the, the governor of FSS says so. But I would say I, I but I would go, okay, so the fiat, you know, the the primary balance is in red. So you know the, the nation is losing money. And the nation is a uh, bankrupt, you know, it's, uh, you know, the same choka, you know, the deficit is more than, you know, it's, it's huge. Okay. And then also tax base is shrinking, you know, uh, uh, population declining. Okay. So, and then you say that you have a back to the fiat. <laughs> so it's like a company, company is in red, insolvent, and also the future business is declining, but companies issuing the, the the fixed income note right. and say this note is with the back. Right. Triple A. <laughs> Unbelievable. But Bitcoin is there's a you know the the, uh, the designed limited supply. Okay. So maybe as a store value, the, the Bitcoin may be better. 
So that what I think, but that not, that kind of a discussion is not widely held in Japan. So that the, as of today, crypto asset is still kind of very very minor geeky kind of thing in Japan. Yeah. But, but one, one thing is one thing is the 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 the, the Beijing will be introducing E1, digital RMB, uh, for the uh, Beijing Olympics. Yeah. It's one year from today, yeah. right? So for, for the Beijing Olympics, many people will come from the globe to Beijing, and they will use the E1, yeah. OK? So the BOJ is now uh, uh, making haste to create a, a digital JPY to try to somehow match that. Right. Once that kind of CBDC uh, comes available, then the landscape will be completely different, I think. Yeah. Matsumoto-san, I'm being told that our time is up, which is a shame because there's like 25 more questions. And I wanted to ask you about TSC reform and about ESG and your sustainable finance and Bank of Japan buying ETFs and so much more we have to talk about. But it seems that we've run out of time. So I just wanted to say thank you so much you're always so interesting to talk to, and I hope that everybody here in the audience from all around the world, it seems, um, has benefited from hearing your ideas. And I wish you all the best with Japan Catalyst. Um, I can't wait to see what happens. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Alicia. Okay. See you soon, Matsumoto san. See you soon. Thank you. Bye bye. And here is a list of our sponsors. Thank you so much to all of our sponsors who support us financially, but also give us valuable advice and uh, keep us abreast of what's going on in the areas of our research. Thank you.